I don't want to wait until 2 o'clock when no one's going to be here in the sanctuary. So right now is the time. Right now is where God has given us. And we are here together, amen? And God has gathered us together. Let's worship. Let's give him everything. We were talking about Sunday school class today about God is wanting our hearts. Now is the time, right? Not later, not next week, not tomorrow. No one even has that guaranteed, including me. You and I don't have tomorrow, but we have now. Let's do it now, amen? Let's come together and let's worship this morning.
praise you. We thank you. Lord, we bless you today. Lord, we praise you. Lord, from whom all blessings flow. There's nothing, Lord, that we have that does not come from your hand. And Lord, we thank you. We give you praise. We honor you. Lord, we ask you to pour out your spirit. We ask you, Lord, to continue to move in and through us. God, you, we call, Lord God, upon your name. We pray, Lord, that your hand would be strong upon us, Lord. We desire, Lord, above all things that, Lord, we would know you and to make you known. And, Lord, we give you thanks and we give you praise today. We ask, God, that you would be at work. We bless you and we praise you. And all God's people said, amen. amen. You may be seated just for a moment. So join with me, if you would, uh, and uh, in the... Um, our mission statement. We always want to make sure we stay grounded in what God has called us to do in every way. And you know what, how that happens? That happens as we remember why we're here, why we are come together, why we exist. And that is to be transformed. So let's say it together. To be transformed by Jesus and to lead our community to him. Amen and amen. Got just a couple of announcements. I want to make sure I hit. There is a lot going on. It's hard to kind of keep up sometimes. Uh, but this week on Saturday, we're going we're to have a get together at our house uh, at 7924 Westfall uh, in, down in East Canton, down on the farm, as they say, right? I want you all to come on down on the farm. So we invite you to come out. It's going to start at five o'clock. Uh, we are going to provide hot dogs and drinks and chips. And we're going to ask folks, if you come, to bring a side dish. We're going to ask you to do that first and foremost. And bring some chairs. I've got some. Some is the key there. Uh, so just bring a chair, if you would, and come out. We're going to have a bonfire, hay ride, Lord willing, all those things. A great fellowship. I have already reached out to about three or four families that I've been inviting to church and asking them to come. And I'm going to ask you to do the same thing. If you've been inviting someone to come, this is a great opportunity. I love what Brother Jeff said. Jeff was talking about that. He said, we, you know what? These fellowship opportunities is a great opportunity to invite people to come and be with you. They can see that we're not some kind of strange. Well, some of you guys might be strange. but I mean, right? We're not really weird or anything else. We're, we're, just, we're just folks like them. And we can come together, and we can and we can fellowship together. And it's, sometimes it break down, breaks down walls. So I'm going to invite you. Invite people to come with you. Invite them to come with you. They're welcome. Anyone is welcome to come this Saturday night at five o'clock. Tomorrow we have small group. We had it uh, last week, and uh, it's so good to see Katie. You're going to be one of our prayer prayer praises number one. That's for sure. Um, right before our small group last Monday night. A man turned in front of Katie, right directly in front of our, our driveway, uh, and, uh, and it, it looked horrific. The fact that the thought that you were even sitting there in this chair six days later is absolutely miraculous. We had another one as well uh, on Friday. Uh, Joseph also had someone pull right in front of him, and he was involved in a car accident, uh, and uh, his wrist. Uh, and uh, we'll, we'll, uh, maybe we'll get a picture of that up on the, up on the I, I don't know what kind of pain meds he was on, but he looked like he was pretty happy there, but uh, <clears throat> I'm sure that wasn't the case, but no, we are, we are blessed. We are so thankful that both of our young people, Katie and, and Joseph, uh, they could be in the hospital or worse. So praise God for that. We want to give God praise for both of those. Uh, uh, but Monday night, right before that, that kicked off our small groups in a memorable way that's for sure uh, then we came on over at 6 30 we meet for small group if you weren't here last week you're not invited no you are invited come on come on and you can come in and uh, monday night at 6 30 jeff's leading that and it was a wonderful wonderful time we're trying to keep it to an hour and so if you want to invite someone they're like oh, i don't want to be at church for three hours they won't they'll be here for an hour so uh, at 6 30 on monday nights we invite you to be a part of and, that too and pastor there's cookies. There's cookies. That's right. There is cookies. There, and you know what? They were really good cookies, by the way, too. They were delicious last week, for sure. And I want to also just, uh, just I, I don't know if you noticed, this looks completely different up here than it last Sunday. Uh, and um, I have, a, I have a, a picture right there. Uh, I, I wanted to show uh, this. There, there's a couple of slides here. Uh, that's one of them. And Mark was in his uh, laboratory there uh, doing his lab work. Uh, and he had this whole corner. He, listen, I, I, I do all joking aside, 
he spent hours upon hours. He had to solder every one of those 16 connections that took, I think, 20 minutes, 30 minutes apiece, 16, and then 16 in the back. And he spent, uh, I don't know, untold hours here. Most uh, of the time were spent redoing the ones that were bad. <laughs> redoing the ones that were bad, right. But he did, Mark really led this project, and we want to say thank you. And then Jason, that's a picture of Jason sitting there in the second row. He was, uh, he, was doing, he was doing our, he was not painting the carpet. It looks like he was, but he wasn't. He was painting the steps over here on either side, and we appreciate all Jason's hard work. And then Ed, uh, Peggy's husband, our office manager, Ed, didn't have a picture of him, but he also spent hours here this week. So we want to give God praise. A lot of hours went into this, and uh, we finished a thousand dollars under budget so God God is good God is, we were talking about being good stewards uh, of our money in Sunday school so we wanted to uh, make sure that we do that lots of other announcements coming up all kinds of things that you see in the bulletin things are coming up we want to make sure that you know about all those things and uh, and be a part of those things all right if you would stand let's uh, greet one another tell someone you're happy to see him in the house of the Lord
we just praise you. We thank you, Lord. We bless you. God, we thank you for this day that you have made. Lord, we rejoice in it. God, we praise you. We, we worship at your feet. Lord, we thank you indeed. We want a heart like you. We want a heart like you, Lord. We want to lay our lives out before you. And we want to give you praise and we want to give you honor and we want to give you glory, Lord. We bless you and we praise you, Lord. We thank you for your goodness and your mercy and your grace, oh God. Surround us, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. You may be seated. We go today to the Lord in prayer. Um, we certainly want to, again, Katie and Joseph, uh, and then uh, my daughter was involved in an accident uh, two weeks ago. She was rear-ended while she was waiting in a light, so if it comes in threes, that's three, right? We don't want any more. Uh, but uh, we want to give God praise. And that were all of our young, right, our young adults. And, and we just want to give God praise for his protection, his, his, his mercy over us. Uh, we want to pray for that. Uh, and, uh, you know, you see our prayer list. I, I pray that you're grabbing that out and putting that in your Bible. That is so important for me. I, I pray over that list uh, daily in my prayers, and I pray that you do too. That's so important. It's important to do that uh, and to pray. So as you see those prayer lists, uh, we want to continue to do that uh, and uh, add Joseph on there and add uh, Max's son, Bob. Uh, he, uh, he has been having some terrible headaches and, and, uh, and some pain, and we want, to, we, want to, we want to be prayer and prayer for Brother Bob as well. Uh, that is for sure. Uh, Dick went through surgery well this week. Uh, Roberta got moved. It's hard to keep up with everyone, it's, uh, but that's why those prayer lists are so important. Write that stuff down. And pray over those things as we pray through the week. And we ask, God, Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you, we bless you, and we praise you. God, we, we honor you today. Lord, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for your mercy. God, we thank you for your grace and your strength. We thank you for the ways that you are at work, God, that you are, you are. We see your amazing hand of mercy. Lord, we've seen it two times in, in vivid color this week. Lord, as two of our, our young adults, Lord God, two of our precious, uh, P, Lord, uh, uh, family here at New Beginning, uh, involved in two horrific accidents, Lord, and, and uh, Lord, both, neither one of their own doing in any way, uh, but Lord, we don't know. We, we don't know the next moment what may happen. And this, this, again, makes us realize that. And so, Lord, thank you that Katie, Lord, and Joseph are safe. Thank you, Lord God, that they are not in a hospital room hooked up to tubes and wires. And Lord, we, we're thankful for that. And so, Lord, we pray for them, Lord, to continue to surround them. Continue, Lord, we know that, that they are still needing healing. And Lord, we pray for that, Lord, from the pains and the aches and the, and the uh, hurt wrist in Joseph's case as well, Lord. We, we pray for them. Uh, Lord, we ask, God, that, that there wouldn't be anything underlying that we cannot see. God, we pray that you would be at work in both of them, bringing healing and strength, Lord. We thank you, Father. We bless you and we praise you. Lord, we thank you for the ways that you are. You're, you're just there. You're there. You're there. God, we just have seen it. We've seen it so clearly this week. Lord, that you go before us. You go before us. Lord, you surround us. You put your grace and mercy upon us. Lord, we thank you for that. Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you for the answers to prayer. We thank you for those praises. We thank you, Lord, that you are at work. God, you're ministering your grace. God, that you're touching. Lord, thank you for Dick's surgery going well, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We, we're just believing they're going to continue to minister to Steve and Lisa and others, Lord, that we've had on our list for a, a, a time, Lord. We're just believing you for continued movement forward in them, Lord, and touch upon their bodies, Lord, we pray in the name of Jesus, Lord. We pray for those that need our prayers today, God, those that are hurting. Father, we pray for Bob, Max's son, Lord, going through a difficult season, a difficult time. We pray, God, that you would stretch it forth your hand and bring healing, Lord, for Roberta being moved again. Lord, I know it's just feels she's been shuffled here and there. And God, we pray that you would be at work, Lord, and that you will continue to minister and put your grace upon, Lord God, we pray. 
Father, that you will minister your, your mercy, Lord God. We thank you, God. We thank you for the ways that you are ministering, you're touching, God, that you are stretching forth your hand, and we pray for that. Pray for those that are traveling this weekend, Lord God, several, Lord, that are traveling. Lord, we pray for your protection upon them. Ask God to give them safety and, and protection as they, as they travel, Lord, we ask in the name of Jesus. And Lord, we praise you. We thank you, Lord, that you are at work. And Lord, we pray this, we, we pray, God, for that list, Lord, that every, every week, Lord, we're praying for those names, Lord, that are strewn across our, our altar. Lord, they, they need, they need you. They need you, Lord. And I pray, God, that you would be at work. Lord, I pray that you would cause us to go out of our comfort zones and, and Lord, be invitational. Lord, to step out, Lord God, and to invite and not invite them just to a worship service, Lord, but to invite them into a life of faith. And Lord, we pray that you would be at work. God, we ask that your hand would be mighty, Lord. We ask that you would strengthen. Oh God, we pray that your hand would be strong. God, that you would cause some to go across that line of faith. And Lord, I pray for that. Lord, I pray for us as we make invitation this week. Lord, I pray that other there, you would have some that we have on that list that would come on Saturday night, Lord God, and, and that they might get into a conversation that might change their eternal destiny. God, I pray that you would do that. I know you're able to. And ask, Lord, that your hand would be strong. God, we bless you and we praise you. We ask, Lord, that you would be at work now. Lord, we pray that as we give, as we honor you with our tithe and offering, as we lay our lives out before you, as we give to you, Lord, as we, as we hand, Lord God, not, not our gifts, but what you've given us as we return them to you. We return, Lord, what you have given us. And Lord, you own everything. And Lord, we just, we, you've just blessed us to hold on to it just for a little bit. And so, Lord, we give back to you and we honor you in our giving. And Lord, we give you thanks. We ask, Lord, that you would bless those that have to give. And Lord, that those that do not have to give, just the same. That you are no respecter of persons. And God, that you would give in us, Lord God, a desire to honor you in all that we do, in all that we are. And we give you thanks. We bless you now in Jesus' name. Amen.
Lord, we thank you. You are indeed our God eternal. There's none like you, Lord. There's none like you. We bless you today. We honor you. We worship you, Lord. We praise you. Lord, we don't want to rush by to something else. Lord, we want to stay in your presence. Lord God, we want to sense, Lord, the moving of your Holy Spirit. Lord, we thank you and we bless you, Lord, that you come. You come not because we're worthy, not because we've done anything to merit anything from you at all. You come because you're faithful. You come because you are full of love and mercy. You come because, Lord, you look down upon us and, Lord, your heart wants so desperately to be in relationship with us. Why? Why, oh God? Why? What is man that you would look upon us is what the psalmist says. How, what is man that you would even think of us a second time? And yet, not only have you done that, but Lord, you bankrupted heaven for us. You gave their very best so that we could be in relationship. So that we could come and sing songs of worship. So that we could, we could, we could come into your throne and Lord, honor you and praise you and give you thanksgiving, Lord, all you have done for us. God, we thank you. Lord, we thank you. We bless you today. We honor you, Lord, and we, we worship at your feet. Oh, God, move in us, Lord. Move in us. Lord, don't let us just go by another Sunday. Lord God, speak into our lives, we pray in Jesus' name. This is what you so told me that you think about the book of Revelation. I'm not guessing this morning. This is what you told me. Last week, I had those cards out, and you guys filled them out. And that, this, this is what we came up. This is where some of the answers that we had. Uh, the, the big one in the center, I think, is the, the one that probably most of us think of, right? The end. The end, right? Uh, no more credits, right? It's it. It's it. The end of the old earth. It's the end of the life as we know it. End of the story that we've had so far. It's God's power. It's confusing. It's scary. It's end times revealed. It's difficult to understand. It's God's second coming. It's all of those things, right? And probably there's a thousand others we could put on that board as well. It's all of those things. And the book of Revelation is, and we're going to dig into it just for a few weeks, and I pray that you would you would find in it not just something scary or confusing. Instead, I hope that you will find in it hope. I hope that you will find in it hope. Ever heard the statement, saving the best for last? You ever heard that? Saving the best for last. Well, you know, it comes from the Bible. You know that, right? What was the first recorded miracle in the Bible? What's the first recorded miracle that Jesus gave, that Jesus did? Which one is it? Turning the water into wine, right? Turning the water into wine at the, at the wedding in Cana of Galilee. Well, what happened? What did the person, the steward, say when he tasted that uh, 1954 vintage red? What did he say? He said, most people give the good stuff at the beginning, and then when everyone's had a little too much to drink, you pull out the Mad Dog 2020, right? You pull out the nasty stuff and start you know, given, passing the flask around, but not you guys. You have saved the best for, the best for last. Jesus brought out the best for last, but every word of the Bible is the best, right? There's no unnecessary parts of the Bible. There's no throwaways of the Bible. Every recorded word is absolutely necessary and it's absolutely important, but there is something special about this book. There's something special about the book of Revelation, one that gets more interest than any other. I was the pastor at the church I came from for almost 13 years, and I never had a response before or after that I did a series, a Bible study on the book of Revelation. I had to move to a bigger room because so many people wanted to come for the book of Revelation. Most of those folks, I never saw at a Bible study before, and I never saw them at a Bible study after. But they all came for the book of Revelation, and there were some that just were, I mean, they were just intrigued at the book of Revelation. 
but they didn't seem to be able to get them interested in other things. But you know what? There is something special about this book. You know that this is the only book that promises a special blessing to those who read and obey it? It's the only book in the Bible, 66 books, that offer a special blessing to those who read and obey it. And it's not just one blessing found in 1-3. There are seven other blessings specifically mentioned in the book of Revelation for those who will study and learn it. One author said this, that even though the book of Revelation may be, and it may be overwhelming to some, I hope by the end of this you're going to be able to say it's not overwhelming. I hope that you'll be able to say that I, I understand it a little more. Are you going to have complete understanding of it? Absolutely not. There's been people that have studied the book of Revelation all their lives, and there still is some mystery there. But I hope that you're going to be able to walk through it a little bit differently. See, because here's the deal. God has basically one message. One message. And that is the good news of salvation. One message. But he plays it in a lot of different tunes. He plays it in a lot of different ways. There's a lot of different songs that he uses, and Revelation is one. So he concludes his written word with this grand vision of the final things given to the last living apostle that had actually spent time with Jesus. That was the apostle John. He was the last living one of the 12. And then, of course, after Judas... Uh, the 13, the one that replaced Judas, he was the last living one. And so we believe the book of Revelation was written about A.D. 95, towards the end of the Domitian, the emperor Domitian's reign in Rome. Towards the end of that, we believe that the book of Revelation was written in A.D., about A.D. 95, on the island of Patmos, which is right off the coast of modern-day Turkey. Over in that Asia, Asia minor, minor area, it's right off the coast, it's an island, it was mountainous, it was rugged, it was a prison hard labor camp. That's what it was. And, and, and take it here, you know how difficult it had to be for the Apostle John, because the Apostle John was above 80 years old, and he was assigned to a hard labor prison camp. So you can imagine how difficult that would have been upon him, and he makes it clear why he was there. He was there for two reasons, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I'm there because of these two reasons. Here is why I'm on the island of Patmos. And it was difficult for him, but it was going to be really difficult because persecution had started and it would only get worse. Persecution was going to ramp up. In the, in, the, in the years that were going to follow, persecution was going to get even stronger. And that's why Revelation, that's one of the main reasons the book of Revelation was given. The book of Revelation was given so that we would have enduring hope. We would have enduring hope because there were some difficult days coming. So in the middle of that, Here's this last book. It's the last one of the canon. It's the very end of the Bible. And here it comes upon the scene at the very end of the first century in about 95 AD. As the Apostle John is on the island of Patmos, he says he was in the spirit on the Lord's day. And here's what happened. He was given an absolute dazzling, explosive picture of the sovereignty of God and the power that God has over all creation. That is what the book of Revelation shows. That cannot be forgotten. Jesus would be shown in this vision of him as an all-powerful one of the, both the past, both the, also the present, and into the future. He would be shown as this, as this amazing, I love the, the picture of Jesus. So let's dive into it. If you got your Bibles, and I know you do. Revelation chapter 1, Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. Listen to what it says in the book of Revelation. Let's go and follow along with me. The revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must what? Soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw, that is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take it to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, 
grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits before his throne and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve his God and Father to him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. What a beautiful beginning picture of what John has experienced. He said he's going to see a picture. He is going to have a dazzling vision of what it means. And what's going to happen is from earth to heaven, we're going to be able to see in eight scenes this movement from earth to heaven. I hope that you'll be able to to follow along with me. It's not a big confusing thing. It's not all the, you know, and people see it and they think, what is that, 10 heads coming out of the, oh, what, what does all those things mean? I'm hoping to be able to show you that these are scenes of what is to come and that you and I are going to be able to follow it from start to finish and that you'll be able to have a much greater view of what it means after we're done. So I want to jump right in to the tribulation, right? The second coming the great white throne judgment, the millennial kingdom, and the eternal state of man. I want to jump right in. I want to get right to it, but you can't. You got to start from the beginning, right? You can't just jump into those places. So I want to take a, just a moment because there's four main ways. There's four main ways, and you have those in your notes. I would, I would just ask you to write those things down because you need to know what are the four main ways people have looked at this book. We're going to look at it, and I'm not going to tell you what you have to, what, how you have to look at it, but I'm going to show you what the Bible says about it. So here's the four ways. Here are the four, four ways. The first one, the first one, we're going to get back to verse, those verses in just a minute. The first one is the four ways this book is usually viewed. The first one is the historicist way. And this is a panorama view. They believe that the book of Revelation is a big view of the church from the first century to the second coming. That this is a picture of, of all the church age, from the, from the first coming of Christ to the second coming of Christ. And this was popular about 300 years after it was written. People saw connections between what was happening all around them and the pictures from this book. So they, they've looked at it and thought, this is just a great big picture, this big panoramic picture of it. But the problem with that is a lot of times you have to wiggle things around to make them fit. A lot of times you have to make things kind of fit. Well, maybe you kind of, kind of have to do those kind of things. And the reformers themselves saw the Pope as the Antichrist. We don't know who the Antichrist exactly is going to be. But the reformers thought of it as the Pope was the Antichrist. That's where they kind of made some things fit into those things. And always go to Scripture, though. I always want to go back to Scripture and comparing to other prophetic Scriptures like Daniel and Matthew, this book is clearly pointing towards a future tribulation time. That's what it says. It says it itself in the Bible. It says it itself, what we just read, that these things would soon come to pass. And then finally, secondly, idealist view. The idealist view looks at it as just a big picture of God versus the devil, good versus evil. That this book is really just about the overall battle that's there. The book was written for battling persecution, though. What kind of, what kind of patient endurance would I get if I believe that this is just some big, great big picture of good versus evil? That's not going to give me any hope for the present time. And so I, we don't believe that the idealist view is the one. It also ignores some very specific time markers that are in the, the book of Revelation, like 42 months and 1,260 days. There are some very specific things that are written in the book of Revelation, and the, the, symbols, the, the, the symbols that are in Revelation have to do with actual events and actual people. They have to do with actual events and actual people. So it's not just a symbolic book. It's more than that. The third view is the preterist view. And the preterist view basically holds this, that this, everything was fulfilled in AD 70 when Jerusalem was leveled 
and the temple, what we see is the temple wall now, the wailing wall, that's all that's left of the temple, the, the Solomon's temple. So if that is, uh, I'm not Solomon's temple, but Herod's temple, if that was true, right, then this was being written after the events. Because 70 AD obviously is before 95 AD. And so the problem with that is the book claims to be prophecy. It claims to be telling of things to come, not with things that already happen. And the problem with that as well is many of the events in the book of Revelation do not line up with what happened in AD 70. They didn't. It, di it didn't line up with any of those things. So we have to make sure that we look at what exactly the book says. And the book does not say that it's looking backwards to events that, are, that already happened and, and claiming that. It actually is saying that it's looking to events that are to happen. And then finally, here's the one, futurist view. The futurist view is that most of the events in the book will be the final things just prior to the second coming of Jesus Christ will be just before the second coming of Jesus Christ. Number one, this supports the claim that the book has that it's prophecy, that it's actually prophecy things that are going to happen. Secondly, the first coming had literal prophecies, right? There were lots of prophecies that talked about the first coming of Jesus Christ. And the Bible says that just as he came once, what's going to happen? He's going to come again. He's going to come back the same way is what the angel said. Why do you look here gazing into the sky? The same Jesus that left is coming back. Why would there not be literal prophecies that would attend his second coming as well? And thirdly, the early church took this view that it was in fact prophecy that was being spoken. So I want to go back for just one second. I want to do that last look. He is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all peoples on earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and was and what? Is to come, is to come. And that is the word that Christ gave us. So here's what we believe. We believe that the book of Revelation carries the idea of revealing. This book reveals something to us. That's what the book of Revelation does. It is both from Jesus and it is about Jesus. It's both from Jesus and it is about Jesus. And this book calls, listen, this book calls every generation of Christians to make a choice about their true allegiance. Who will you trust? Who will you put your faith in? Who will you believe? Who will you have enduring patience for? Who will you be waiting for and ready? Jesus says many times, be ready. Amen? Be ready. For the Son of Man will come at an hour and a day you do not expect. Be ready. Be ready. Be ready. The stakes couldn't be higher. Amen? Amen? The stakes couldn't be higher, and the cost more clearly outlined. What we do with this Savior, will make, who, who's going to make a remarkable appearance again, and who makes a remarkable appearance in these first few pages of the book of Revelation as it opens, the stakes could not be higher. You and I are going to have to make a choice as to what we believe. And Revelation calls us to our true allegiance. What will we believe? What will we believe? And then I want you to co continue on with me in Revelation, the first chapter, and here's what it says at the ending of this first chapter. I, John, your brother and companion, and the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. And on the Lord's day, I was in the spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet which said, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me, and when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, 
reaching down to his feet and with a golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing water. Is that amazing to you? Does that, ama that would be amazing to me, right? What would my response be? What would be your response be? And in his right hand he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all of its brilliance. Do you get a picture of what, we, what John saw when he turned around? And guess what he did? He did the same thing all of us would be doing. You'd be finding a face plant, right? You'd, find, you'd be finding a place to get real low and before this. And he said, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. Oh, I like that. I am the living one. I was dead and now look. I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and hell. Amen? What a picture. What a picture of that. What an amazing picture that John says. Just think about it for a moment. Can you imagine the, 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 uh, the old apostle having outlived all the other ones. He's only got a handful of years left. He would die within five years of the writing of this book. His, his, he was towards the very end of his life, and he hears the voice of Jesus. You know what? One author said it may have been 60 years since he had heard the physical voice of Jesus. It may have been, right? That, that, that he had heard him in his spirit, but he heard him. He heard the sound of his voice again. He heard Jesus, and Jesus would have a message for the ages. Amen? He would have the message for the ages that, that, would, that would show him his description of Jesus is absolutely important. We have, to, we have to start there. What does it look like? What did he see when he turned around and saw Jesus? What was the first thing that he mentioned? He said he had a long something. What did he have on? A long robe. What does the long robe mean? Why, why is that important? Why is it important that he had a long robe and a sash? It's important because it designated him as a priest. It designated Jesus as a priest. He was the last high priest. Right? What did he do that was so important? What did he do as the last high priest that was so important for us? Do you remember what he did? What did he do at the very end of his ministry as he died on the cross? That it said that he entered into the most holy place as the last high priest. And he offered his own blood for us so that we could be forgiven and our sins could be wiped out. That is the very end. So the next vision that John has is this glorified Jesus standing there in the long robe and the sash signifying that Jesus is the last high priest. He is the priest that can offer sacrifice for us. His white hair. Why is it important that he had white hair? And he talked about the white hair. It stands for wisdom and purity. Wisdom and purity. Why was it important that he had fire? It says his eyes were like fire, right? Holiness. That the holiness of God, the holiness of Jesus, the fiery eyes that he saw. It, it shows the holiness of God. And not only that, but it also shows that he is able to see things as they are. He's able to see through everything, right? He's able to see things as they actually are. His eyes of fire. His face was shining like the, trans, like the transfiguration, right? John had been up on the mountain of transfiguration with Christ when he was transfigured. And he says here that his face shined like brilliant. Like the brilliance of the sun shining. So what an amazing view of Jesus, amen? He was not this, right? He wasn't the, the Jesus. He didn't go struggling out of the grave. That's for sure. Amen. He kicked that stone out of the way. We can see what kind of Jesus, what kind of God that we serve, one of power and might, one of glorious, dazzling presence. And it says John fell as if dead. It always amazes me when someone, someone says this. I don't know how many times I've heard this in ministry. Way too many times. 
When I get to heaven, I'm going to ask God. Listen, when we, you and I see God, there isn't going to be a ground far enough that I can't get my face into. Amen? What happened? Did, did John say, hey, Jesus, I got some questions for you. He turned around, saw Jesus. He did a face plant. Right? He went down. It always amazes me when someone tells me that. I'm going to ask God. I've got some questions to ask God. <laughs> I don't think God's going to be answering any of my questions. Right? I don't think I'm going to have any questions. I'm going to be like, I'll, I'll be like Elmer Fudd, right? Whenever I see, I'm going to be getting on the ground when I see him. That's what John, that's the kind of description John gives of Jesus. And he said, I fell as if dead at his feet. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks it said that he was right in the midst of them why is that important the candlesticks represent the church the church the seven churches and the candlestick is important because the church is the light of the world right given light by Jesus we are the light in the darkness and he's in the midst of the seven candles you know what that means that Jesus is in the midst he knows exactly what's going on in the church amen He's not far off. It said he's right in the midst of them. In fact, he's such in the midst that he holds in his hand seven stars. And it says the seven stars stand for the messengers or the angels. Some believe the angels, right? There's angels that, that guard, like guardian angels over churches. And that he holds that, but it means messengers. The messengers of the churches he holds in his hand. He holds the message of the church in his hand. That that's the picture that we have as he's in the seven golden lampstands and he's holding the seven stars. He's holding the messengers, the angels of the church in his hands. He's right in the midst of him, the light of the world, giving light to the candles of the church. And I love what he says, do not be afraid. Fear is one of the main things that people talk about when they talk about this book. A lot of people are afraid of this book, right? I don't want to, I, 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 it just, it scares me. It scares me. It must have scared John because it said he placed his hand on John and he says, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid because I'm here. Don't be afraid because I'm the one, I was the first and last. I'm the alpha and omega. I was the one who was dead and now I'm alive again. I'm that one. Don't be afraid. There's no reason to be fearful. I am the first and last. No fear of anything beyond him. I am the living one. No fear of death. No fear of life itself. I was dead and now I am alive forevermore. Death has been destroyed. He holds death in his hand. He has a grip on it. And he has the keys to death and hell. No fear. He is an absolute charge. Isn't that good news? I don't, I don't want to be afraid of this book. I want to be in this book. I want to know what it says, right? Because he's saying he is holding on to it. He has the keys. You know what the keys mean? Keys mean authority. If I have the keys to my house, guess who has authority? I do. I'm able to get in and out of my house. We lock doors because we don't want people to be able to just to go in and out. We want to have authority, right? It says that he has the authority. And one day he's going to close one day he is going to close those doors. And here's how he ends that first chapter. Write, therefore, what you have seen, what is now and what will take place later, the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and of the seven gold lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. One day he will close the door of death. Amen? That's what Revelation's talking about, that there's going to be an ending to it, death and hell, and he's going to lock it for the last time. Isn't that going to be good news? He's going to lock the door of death and hell for the last time. He's going to close the door and lock it, and it will forever be gone. That's the hope that he was giving the churches as they're reading the letter, that he holds the keys and that he's going to be the one that will decide, and he will be the one that will end it. He will be the one. He's ready to get, getting ready to give John a picture of final things. And at the end, there is a bridegroom coming for his bride. And there is a new city coming down, and there is a wedding. Ain't that right? Lord just got back from a wedding. There's a wedding coming. 
not just in Germany. It's going to be the big one, right? It's coming down out of heaven. There's a bridegroom, there's a bride, there's a city, and there's a wedding coming. And that is what the book of Revelation is about. Jesus is calling on his people to hold on. Hold on. Don't quit. Don't give up. Don't, don't throw it away. I can't. I, I just am still shocked at how many. In fact, I was talking uh, to someone not that long ago, and we were talking about that. And they said, I am just surprised at how many people that I knew years ago. This was a person that was older. They said, how many people that I knew years ago that have stopped going to church? They've stopped reading their Bibles. They've stopped praying. They stopped doing, right? They, 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 just, they just have stopped. And that's what the book of Revelation is trying to tell you. Don't quit. Don't quit. There's an ending coming, amen? There's an ending coming. No one else is going to be able to drive this car. Jesus alone is in command. No matter what it may look like from the outside, he is in charge. Oh, I got like nothing on that. He is in charge, amen? Don't buy a word of it unless it lines up with the Lord of heaven and earth. Don't buy it. Don't do it. The light of the world is in the middle of the lampstands. The church is the light, and that the one that gives us light is there. And that means he's not far away. He is close. Our Lord is close. He knows exactly what's going on. He's not distant. God knows just what is in the middle and what we're in the middle of right now. He knows it. You know that, right? Whatever you're facing, whatever we're facing, whatever our country's facing, whatever our world's facing, he's in the middle of it. God is in the middle of it. He knows that. And he is doing the message that he began the earth and that he will end it. It's going to begin, right? These eight scenes begin on earth and it finishes in the heavens. That's the, that's the, that's the movement that we're going to look at. And so he says, write these things down. Write them down. Those things that you see, some of which is now and some of it which will take place. He talks about some of it which is now, which is chapters 2 and 3. He's talking to the churches, talking specifically to them to be ready to, get, to, to return to their first love, to repent from those things, to keep themselves holy, to be ready to strengthen those things that are remaining in you. Don't quit. Don't give up. He starts it like that. Don't quit. Don't give up. And in the middle of all this, I tell you what will not happen, what will not be replaced is trust. And here's why. We are called to trust him. He has not and will not spell out every detail. If you're looking for one of those great big ginormous maps where I've detailed every single thing so you can figure out to the day and the hour, you ain't going to find it. You know why? Because it ain't there. It ain't there. <laughs> Jesus says, guess what he says? The Son of Man will come at an hour not expected. So if I tell you when he's coming, guess what? Don't expect him to come that day. If I, if I were to tell you he's coming back on November 10th, I can almost guarantee you he's not coming back November 10th. Because then you know, right? He's not. So if you're looking for those kind of things, you're not going to find it in this book of Revelation. We're going to look at the seven bowls and the seven trumpets. We're going to look at all those. And we're going to look at these pieces because they're scenes. What they are, they're scenes. They are a, a story thread that goes from where he started, him, him standing among the lampstands, to Jesus standing at the great white throne judgment. It's a scene going through there. And that's the story. And I pray that you, I pray you and I would know that it's about trusting him. Trusting him. He's going to give us some amazing pictures of what will take place and, and what we are to patiently endure but you know what? It's going to be up to us. It's going to be up to you and me. You know what? I, I don't think I've ever, I've ever sensed more of a need for patient endurance than right now. It reminds me, I'm, I've been reading a book. I've been re I know it's hard for you guys to think about that. I, I actually do read sometimes, but uh, I'm reading a book. I'm reading a book, and on the back of it, it says this. In an age of 30-second commercials, in an age of 30-page cliff notes, in an age of instant banking, and it's even, become, even gotten much greater since this book is written, it's not difficult to get a person interested in the gospel. It is terrifically difficult to sustain it. 
It's terrifically difficult to sustain it. Lots of people want to come in, oh, I want to know, just tell me about all those crazy pictures and all that stuff. And then once they learn, kind of wander off. That's not what this book is about. This book is about you and I staying. This book is about you and I staying fervent for the Lord. Jesus said, even so, I come quickly. Even so, I come quickly. When's that going to be? No man knows the day nor the hour. But Jesus said it's coming. Jesus said it's coming. He's coming back again. He's coming back again, amen? We believe he's coming back again. And I know we've heard that so many times. You're like, yeah, okay, yeah, you're coming back again. But he is. He is coming back. And you know what? The first time he came, guess who missed him? Most. Right? Most missed him. He's coming back again. So he starts this book with a warning and encouragement to the seven churches, and it applies to all of us. This book was written for us to endure. So we're not going to look at chapters. I'm not going to look at chapters. We're going to look at scenes. Because the problem is, too many times in the Bible, we look at chapters and verses. Guess who did not write in chapters and verses? The Holy Spirit. Chapters and verses are us. We put chapters and verses in there. God didn't. It's one story from beginning to end. From Genesis to Revelation, it's one story. So we're going to be looking at it. The next seven scenes that we're going to look at are all going to be just in order. We're going to have scenes from earth to heaven, and we're not going to look at chapters and verses. We're going to look at the story and the scenes of those things that are going to take us from heaven, from earth to heaven. We're going to look at those things. There's always going to be temptation to stop short. There's always going to be a temptation to, to stop, stop or quit. There's always going to be that. But then in the middle of that, there's always going to be the mercy of God calling us. There's always going to be that. And the glory of Jesus dominates this book. If there's one thing to, that this book says, it's the glory of Jesus dominates this book from beginning to end. And I love that picture of Jesus. I love that picture that he shows. I am the beginning and the end. I am the Alpha and Omega. I am the first and last. I hold the key. So I hope that you and I are going to endure. I hope you and I are going to dig in to this book. The next ones are going to be these scenes, these amazing, powerful scenes of what is to be. And you know what? That's going to give us a patient endurance. A patient Don't quit. Don't give up. Don't stop. It's worth it. It's going to be worth it. And we're going to look at every picture and every scene as we get to that place. Man, I want to get there, don't you? I want to get there. Even so, come Lord Jesus. At the end of this book, I, I, I'm, I'm just going to mess it up for you. Chapter 22, you know what we're wanting? They're wanting it to come. You know why? I, have, I pray that after you see these scenes, you're wanting it to come even more. You're wanting it to come. And so a lot of people want to know, are we living in the last days? Yes, we are. Yes, we are. Because the last days are between his first and second coming. So we're living in the last days. I can guarantee you we're living in the last days. But what, that, what is that going to mean? Am, am I going to be able to show you every single thing? No. But what it's going to be is a picture of of God's victory over sin, death, and the devil. And that is glorious. That is glorious. No wonder John fell. Amen? It may not hurt us to do a few of those. Just get on the, just get on the floor one day and do a little prayer time on your face, right? That's always a good thing. Because we see what the powerful, majestic presence of God. Lord, I pray, Lord, in the name of Jesus, God, I thank you and I praise you, Lord. I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your mercy and your grace, Lord. I pray that as we begin looking at these scenes, Lord, as we begin to look at these amazing, powerful pictures of the things that are to come, the tribulation, Lord God, the, the, the second coming, the judgment seat, Lord, all of those things, Father, I know it, it, it can be overwhelming sometimes and we can just sense what do we do with all this. Uh, what, what, uh, it, it can be fearful, it can be confusing, it can be scary, but I pray that it's none of those things. 
that we have the great high priest. We have the one who was dead and now is alive again. We have the one whose hair is like wool, whose eyes like fire, a sword coming out of his mouth, the brilliance of his face shining like the sun, the stars in his hands, sash across his chest, Lord. We have you. We have the one who was and is and is to come. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Lord, we believe that. We trust in you. Lord, I pray that as we ready ourselves, and Lord, as we, as we, it gives us endurance to continue on. Lord, I pray it wouldn't just give us endurance, but it also would give us passion. Passion to, to win others to, to you, Lord, to tell others about the things that are to come. Lord, to tell others, Lord, that there's a day coming when we will stand before a holy God. We will stand before the one who was pierced for our transgressions who was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our sins and our transgressions was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. That one day we are standing there. And Lord, I pray that that would give us hope, Lord. That would give us hope. That would give us an endurance, Lord, that will not quit. Lord, I ask that you would be at work, Lord, as we look at this book. And Father, I pray that we wouldn't look at it as some kind of a, a, a map, some kind of a guidebook so we can unlock things, so we can figure everything out. But instead, it would give us hope that this day will soon come when Jesus Christ will be crowned King of kings and Lord of lords as you are, but you will be above all things, that time will cease, time will be no more, that death and hell will be thrown and locked away forever. That, Lord, we are going to be given new bodies, resurrected ones. We are going to walk with you and we shall forever be with the Lord. That we're going to have that hope. We're going to have that, that patient endurance because of what it is. Lord, I thank you that you gave us this final book. You gave us this final picture of what it means to walk in you. We ask, God, that you would help us to walk as those that are wise, those that under, have understanding, that you would help us to walk in truth, and righteousness, and holiness. You would help us to walk as those, Lord God, that are ready and preparing for the soon appearing of our Savior. Lord, I pray that you would ready us in the name of Jesus. Would you stand as we sing? Indeed, amen means so be it, right? So be it. Amen, so be it. Even so, Lord, come quickly. Amen. So be it. So be it. Lord, I pray that as we leave this place, Lord, that you would go in a special way. Lord, that you will continue to call us into the closer place, into a place of, of, of Lord, of, of sacrifice, into a place of surrender, Lord, to you. 
and always, Lord God, and that this book, Lord God, along with the others, Lord, the word of God would give us such a hope, such an endurance, Lord God, that we will not quit, we will not give up, we will not turn around, we will keep going and be strengthened, Lord God, for you will soon come and we will be forever with you, Lord. What a blessed presence, what a blessed promise. And Lord, we give you thanks. We ask God that you would be at work in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you. Amen. Thank you. Have a blessed week. God bless you. Thank you for being with us. If you join us online, thank you for being with us. And God bless you. Altars are open as always. Have a blessed week.